thank you for being here tonight for this discussion. I think it'll be informative and extremely helpful. My name is Tammy Gisselman. I'm the university chaplain here at the University of Evansville. Consider it an honor to be host for this conversation, and I hope that this is just one in a series. Uh, in fact, we're talking about doing a kind of series, uh, this being the last overview of how we will proceed tonight. Uh, first of all, the goal, as I said, is to learn something. So hopefully everyone comes to the table with that uh, in mind and we can walk away more informed uh, based on what we hear from our two distinguished panelists tonight. Uh, the first 35, 38 minutes will be dedicated to uh, a conversation between, may I call you David and Omar? Between David and Omar. And there are topics, there are three topics that we'll uh, follow. And uh, really my job is to make sure that neither one of them get long-winded. <laughs> uh, so that's my role. Uh, so we'll uh, motion through our topics. David and Omar will have a conversation for about 10 minutes, then we'll move to the next topic. Again, they'll have a conversation. And so at the end, uh, we'll wrap up and then offer our audience, you, an opportunity to ask questions of our panelists. So as you listen, I'll ask that you formulate questions. Uh, it won't necessarily be a time for us to give our speeches after they're finished but a time to probe their responses to one another. So do formulate questions uh, for the second half. We do want to honor our time. Uh, 6.15 is the end, but uh, since we started just a couple of minutes late, 6.20, we'll try to wrap up for sure by then. Understanding we can't cover everything tonight, but we'll look forward to our fall semester and part two in this series, in this dialogue, uh, with these esteemed panelists. So let's begin by uh, hearing a brief introduction of our panelists and ask them to tell you just a little bit about themselves and then we'll launch into the first topic. And do use the mics. Yeah. <clears throat> My name is David Hayden. I'm <clears throat> born here in Evansville. Graduated from Modern Day High School. I taught uh, High school English for 30 years here in Evansville and Washington Catholic High School and also the uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the Latin school here in Evansville. But uh, the reason I'm here tonight talking to you about this topic is that when 9-11 when happened in, in 2001, I wanted to find out why it happened. I wanted to understand the motivation of the people that, that perpetuated this uh, event and why they did it, the motivation. So I began studying, I began reading, I read the Quran, I read uh, many books on, on Islam, and the history of Islam, the, uh, and so on. And over the course of time, I, I came to the conclusion after, after about six years of study that I, f I thought I found the reason why it happened and what motivated them. And before you give us that answer, let's let Omar introduce himself and then we'll launch into the okay, discussion at hand. That. Thank you, David. All right, thank you, Tammy. And uh, again, I'm honored and humbled that uh, we, we have this opportunity and uh, also humbled by the fact that uh, David agreed for us to do this uh, for the public's uh, benefit. I think it's, uh, it's genuinely uh, very courageous uh, that, that we're able to do this. Uh, I don't want to say courageous of me because I'm, I'm, you know, I've been having to do it for the last four years all the time. <laughs> but, uh, but I think it's very courageous that we're doing it in the public sphere. Uh, and it's really to encourage this. But my name is Omar Atia. I was born in Elgin, uh, which uh, didn't, wasn't then part of Chicago, but now it's part of Chicago because of the growth of uh, cities and suburban drift. Um, so I was born in Elgin, Illinois, and I uh, grew up 
uh, part of my life in Cairo, Egypt. My parents are both of Egyptian origin. Uh, became religiously aware, if you will, at the age of 18 or 19 and started practicing my faith according to what I understood to be the proper way to practice it uh, around that age. Uh, and then I started learning as much as I could, though my degrees in uh, uh, chemical engineering uh, from Purdue University and um, mechanical masters in, uh, from Purdue as well. Uh, my passion has always been theology and, uh, and our faith and comparative religion uh, and uh, society in general and, and what affects us as people and how we can come together and, and uh, raise our aspirations. So that's what motivates me to be here with you and I'm honored that you guys have made your way out here on a Sunday afternoon, beautiful Sunday afternoon to some extent, and, and looking forward to the discussion with David. We already had a previous discussion, just so everyone knows, this is the first time we're talking. We had a very nice uh, get together at a coffee shop recently, and we plan to do more of that as well. Not all of these are gonna be in front of you guys, but uh, we'll look forward to as many of them as possible. Thank you both. And uh, just a point of personal privilege, you all understand how sensitive this discussion is when you are talking about religion, especially your own, and trying to interpret that religion to others, it can be very difficult. <clears throat> so I admire both David and Omar for being here, and I think if we proceed with that understanding of sensitivity, uh, we'll all be better for it. So let's uh, move into the first topic, and uh, David, I'll pose this to you first and let you speak to it and then Omar, you and Omar can have this sort of conversation in about a 10 minute uh, time frame. So the first question or topic, what is the proposed path out of the crisis within Islam today and the crisis in the world that is resulting from violent extremists claiming Islam as their inspiration? David. <clears throat> well, the, um, the proposed path out of the crisis within Islam, I think before we can really talk about that, we need to talk about what is the crisis within Islam. And to me, if you look at the history of Islam, beginning with the, the revelations from Allah to, to Muhammad, and take, going through Muhammad's life and his death, and then the history of Islam, from 632 uh, David, AD. David, excuse me, uh, hold the mic just a little closer. We okay. want people to hear you, so. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay? Yeah. okay, so up to the time of his death in 632 and beyond, the history of Islam, I think that you can learn a lot about why there is a crisis in within Islam today. And what I'm talking about here is that when Muhammad was in 610, when he received the revelations from Allah, began receiving them. He actually received them from 610 to 632 during his life, and then he died in 632. But anyway, when he, when he received these revelations, there were revelations that were very peaceful, and there were also revelations that very much talked about fighting the infidel, fighting the disbeliever fighting the Quraysh, which was uh, the, the tribe that he, that he was a part of in Mecca. So we have this duality of the sorts in, within, within Islam. There, there are the, the, the surahs, the, the, the um, I'm using the Islamic terminology here, the, the chapters, chapter and verse. There are chapters that deal with the, the peaceful side of Muhammad and, and Islam. But then there's the violent side also. And what we see in Islam today is a tremendous amount of violence within Islam. And we don't, I, I've got a list of things here I can talk about, but I think just to speed things up here, that's basically what I would say. There's a lot of there's a lot of Muslim on Muslim violence, and there's a lot of Muslim on infidel or disbelievers, whatever word you want to use for that. There's a lot of that also. And that's, that's what I think that we need to keep that in mind. And having said this, I want to make sure that you understand that I do not hate Muslims. I do not. 
I, I, just, I have a great disdain for the word Islamophobia because I don't think that the fear that people might have about Islam is grounded in reality. So, but I, but I have no, nothing against Islam as, as, a, as a religion uh, and certainly against Muslims. Omar is a very nice individual. We had a very, very good conversation just the other day. But I, I, my, my main contention is that if we're going to get out of this crisis that, that is within Islam and also within our own culture, <clears throat> For instance, in the United States, you know, we have, we're, we're, we're at a crisis too. The United States and Europe and, and how to deal with the threat of Islamic Jihad, as I call it. And we, act, we react differently. There are some people like with, with a terrorist attack, they may um, get very angry, they become very angry at any Muslim they see on the street. I'm not one of those. There are other people who uh, just become apathetic and say, well, it won't happen to me, so I'm just going to ignore it. And I think we ignore this problem at our own peril. I think that we have to understand what's going on and why it's going on, and that's, that's what I've been trying to understand. Um, so the, the path out of this, this conflict between the Muslims and and the non-Muslim world, I think, deals with understanding. And what I want to say is that to understand this whole situation, we have to, I, I'm coming from the point of view that there are Muslims who I, I call supremacists. And the supremacist, and Omar may um, you know disagree with me on this, but that's all right. But the supremacist is one who believes that the revelations that Allah received are believed in the sense that that they should use whatever means necessary to make the world safe for the establishment of, of Islam. And that that includes violence as well as the peaceful methods of achieving that. And I think we have to recognize that there are, now I'm talking about supremacists here. I'm not talking about Omar Atiyah. I'm not talking about a lot of Muslims. In fact, probably most Muslims. But I'm talking about the ones that are dedicated to use Islamic jihad, violent, political, doesn't matter, to use jihad to make Islam the dominant religion in the world. In fact, I think ultimately the, the only religion in the world. Unless you, you are a Christian or a Jew that accepts the idea that you will be a, basically a second class citizen living as a dhimmi within areas that are controlled by Islam. Okay, I'm going to so, pass the okay. microphone. That's thank fine. you. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so the first thing I just want to answer is, uh, or kind of just shed some light on that David mentioned, that you mentioned David, was the concept of that the revelations had mixed a mixed bag. And, and uh, to the sort of the, um, the surface assessment of the Qur'an, it is very natural to read the Qur'an and look at some verses and say, well, these sound violent. Look at some verses and say, these sound peaceful. So which is it, violent or peaceful? And, uh, and Generally, what ends up happening, and what I've noticed, you know, when I read some of your book and, and some of your articles, that the general assessment is made uh, to look at the violent ones and say, well, it doesn't matter how many peaceful ones there, ones there are. If there's these violent ones and people are following these violent ones, then then Islam preaches violence. And the further contention that I noticed you made and that we talked about in the coffee shop was that the Prophet Muhammad himself, peace and blessings upon him, he, he he actually spread Islam through that violence. So the first thing is to understand the context of the life of the Prophet, peace and blessings upon him. No Muslim who has had even the basic training in, in understanding the Qur'an uh, knows other than the fact that you cannot take one verse out of the Qur'an and apply it without understanding the totality of the message of the Qur'an. Because that's actually considered heresy in the Qur'an. 
God says in the Quran, أَتُؤْمِنُونَ بِبَعْضِ الْكِتَابِ وَتَكْفُرُونَ بِبَعْضِ Do you believe in part of the scripture and then disbelieve in other parts of the scripture? So a person who takes a verse or a set of verses in the Quran out of context, even within their context and only applies those and doesn't look at the rest of the Quran to understand what is the appropriate uh, verse uh, set for their context, what is the appropriate teaching and guidance to make decisions based on for their context, is actually committing heresy in our faith. And no Muslims in the world who understand the Quran properly have a problem stating that those who have achieved, who have uh, transgressed the bounds of all humanity, uh, let alone, of course, the bounds of Islam, which to us are very much more stringent in terms of not uh, making sure that the world is nonviolent, uh, are absolutely criminal and have no association with understanding the Quran in its totality. The Prophet Muhammad had verses that were revealed upon him in Mecca, and chapters of the Quran revealed upon him in Mecca for 13 years. During those 13 years, people that were following his message were killed. And he would pass by, he passed by in the very first years of the message being public. There was a woman named Sumayya. She's known as the first martyr in the faith. That woman, who was the first martyr in the faith, was killed three years into the message. The Prophet, peace and blessings upon him, passes by while she's being killed and says to them, she and her husband says, be patient for your promise is paradise. Because there was no permission to stand up against the aggression and the persecution and the murder of his tribe, his homeland, his people, which included his cousins. Uh, ex uh, except that God hadn't yet given the permission. Then God revealed 13 years later, in fact it was almost 13 and a half years later, to those against whom war is made, to those against whom war is made, permission is given to fight because they are wronged, and verily God is most powerful for their aid. So the permission was given not five years after people started being killed, not ten years, but thirteen and a half years after people were being killed because of their faith, because of nothing else except that they wanted to free and liberate people from being treated unequally because of their skin, because of their social caste. All these rules and laws of Quraysh, which the, which the Prophet peace and blessings upon him was told by God in the Quran, because we, we're going to talk about the word jihad next. وَجَاهِدْهُمْ بِهِ جِهَادًا كَبِيرًا that he was talking about the Qur'an, and he revealed this to him three years into the, into the message. Ten years before fighting was permitted, God told the Prophet, commit to jihad against the disbelievers with it. And the it that he was talking about was the scripture. So if, how would the Prophet, peace and blessings upon him, commit murder with the scripture? Is he going to smack them on the head with some pages? Other, obviously not. The jihad that God was talking about was the jihad that is understood by the majority of Muslims around the world which is that you strive and struggle for truth and justice, and that you expend all, relentlessly expend all that you can for truth and justice, and that you expend all that you can to establish peace in the land. Because the only way that people can actually make their mind up as to what values they want to govern themselves by and uphold in their own personal lives, after assessing all the different options, is if there's peace in the land. And that's why God, in, during his, the Medina period, the period after which fighting was permitted. The clearest victory, and I'll conclude with this, the one that was called the clearest victory wasn't a fight and wasn't a battle. The clearest victory during the, the life of the Prophet, as called in the Quran, was the treaty that established peace in the land. And during that treaty time period, for 10 or 12 years, excuse me, for, uh, for 18 years of the life of the Prophet, peace and blessings upon him, the total people who believed with the Prophet were about uh, 1,400 able-bodied men and their families. By the time of two years after that peace treaty was established, where there was no fighting in Arabia, 100,000, 10,000 men went with him to, to Mecca, and one year later, 100,000 people were in the pilgrimage with the Prophet, peace be upon him, believing in God alone, following his message. And so what's clear to all Muslims, except those who do what we believe others who are also misunderstanding the totality of the Qur'an are doing, which is they're taking verses out of context, saying, well, this is, this is what's governing our day-to-day. -day, okay, I'm going to stop you there. Uh, thank you both. Uh, sort of segued into the next question, but 
uh, I think many of us do want to hear more about the concept of jihad. So, uh, David, since we started with you first, we'll let uh, Omar respond to this uh, question and topic. Omar, talk about jihad. How do you define it? How uh, is it lived out, if at all, in your own community here in Evansville? Is that a doctrine that's talked about? Could I just make one comment about what he just said? Just, just very brief. Yeah, sure. I'll give him for my time. <clears throat> Yeah, if it's a minute, maybe the both of you can have a minute. Okay, you talked about taking things out of context. And I don't know, I, I sent you at least a month ago, maybe two months ago, a, a list of, of uh, quotations from the Quran, which, in which I provided context for each one of them. There were 27 violent verses that I, that I, I studied and wrote the context for each one of those. Mike, so use your mic. It's not, it's not that I just pick out verses out of the Quran out of, randomly. I mean, I read, I read the whole Quran twice. And again, you're, you're more learned than the Quran than I am, but I read it twice and I try, really tried to study it with an open mind. And those were my conclusions. And I think maybe that would be valuable for the next session, either with us alone and then, and then with the public to go through those 27 because uh, I haven't, I'll be honest, I hadn't looked at the email, but I, I'm not, uh, I wouldn't be surprised that it's not any different than many of the verses we've actually been studying in our study circle to look at those. We looked at 12 verses uh, in, in chapter of Toba and other chapters and discussed the political context that those verses were referring to. Uh, I, I want to go back quickly while I'm defining jihad to talk about out of the crisis because I think... So are you moving in it? I'm going to answer both questions as succinctly as I can yeah. with the one answer. Okay. <laughs> because I never said what I think is the way out of crisis. And, and in the executive summary of what I think is the way out of the crisis is actually that we come to a point where we're not dividing Muslims into on, only these two groups that are, uh, to me, are, uh, are both completely missing and adulterating what the core message of the faith is. One group says that Islam is a faith that's supposed to be established, like you said, by quote unquote, any means necessary even if that includes violence. That's the group that's mainly represented by the ISIS of the world and Al-Qaeda and, and other groups that are using violence and coercion. Or, like you said, they turn people into thimbies or coerce them to become Muslim, uh, which is completely contrary, as you pointed out in our last meeting, to quite a few verses in the Quran. And so how do you reconcile those? The other group is the group that you told me I should side with, which is, uh, uh, you know, some, uh, some, some names are, are Jasser Zuhdi and, and others who have said that, look, in order for Islam to be relevant today, we have to abandon the concept of jihad. The way out of the crisis is actually that people, number one, understand what jihad really means and apply it based on the context that's appropriate for our day and time. And I actually implore that all Americans commit to jihad. And I'll explain, based on what I mean by that, why we should all be jihadis as the appropriate jihad is. Because what jihad means is to relentlessly give of your time, talent, and treasure for the sake of justice. Now, that means one of those things that you're supposed to give of your time, talent, and treasure to do is to ensure freedom of choice, is to ensure peace in the land, is to ensure that those who wreak havoc are not allowed to have a space in the societal structure. As such, committing to jihad together Muslims and non-Muslims, if we understood it as the relentless pursuit of social justice and, and of right conduct and of uh, laws that we all agree are ensuring the freedom of choice, are ensuring the freedom of faith, are ensuring the freedom of, of practice of what we believe will be best for us and of making and choosing what will govern us best. This is actually jihad. Our forefathers, our founding fathers of this nation committed to jihad when they had to revolt against the British uh, imperial aims in America. That's jihad. Jihad is also when a person stands up to an unjust law and says we will advocate and gather signatures and fight for the rights of those who are less than, as the Bible teaches, those who are least of these, my brother. That is jihad. Our our, the Prophet Jesus, peace upon him, we believe, was absolutely rallying his disciples to jihad. Because that jihad doesn't mean 
fighting militarily, unless you are being fought militarily to stop you from standing up for what's right. That's why it took 14 years for God to give permission to the Prophet and the companions with him until they were given permission after their property was taken, their land was taken, their homes were taken, but it was when they were now being fought for trying to establish a social space, a pluralistic social space, where pagans were given the same treatment as Jewish people, given the same treatment as Muslims in that new constitution and city which was unparalleled in the world. And now the Quraysh wants to invade and stop that new city from forming. So they were permitted to fight back against them. So jihad is to stand for social justice and to give of your time. Everyone, a human, realizes that we're born to uplift and inspire this world to what's better. We recognize that everyone has the right to individual choice of what they personally follow. But for the social sphere, that we seek what's most equitable and what's most just and what's most uh, uh, prosperous for all, not just for some. That's jihad.